Good morning. Today is uh, May 9th, 2023. Time is 8.35 a.m. The committee on parole is called to order. Uh, the panel today will be Ms. Bonnie Jackson and Mr. Pete Freeman, and I am Alvin Roche. With the, the committee on parole is seated at DOC headquarters in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. With the staff at DOC, please introduce yourself. Hello. Lindsay Mario. Kyle Williams. Francis Abbott. Thank you, staff. Our first remote location this morning is the Louisiana State Police Barracks. With the staff at the barracks, please introduce yourself. Lieutenant Jeremy Burns, Executive Officer. Captain Patrick Washington, Commander. Please appraise your classification. Thank you, uh, thank you, Barracks. We are ready for our first case. Uh, would the offender please introduce yourself and give your DOC ID? My name is Jared Francis. My number is 86386. Thank you, Mr. Francis. Uh, Mr. Francis, uh, I think you are familiar with the process already. I think this is hearing number six for you. Is that correct? Five, sir, I think. Five. Is it hearing number five? Okay. Um, but I, I will explain the process for those of uh, you here for the first time. I will read some information into the record. Once that information is in the record, We'll conduct a parole interview with Mr. Francis. At the appropriate time, we'll give Captain Washington and Lieutenant Burns a chance to make comments if they wish. And then we'll give the uh, opposition a chance to make statements. And then we will give um, the supporters a chance to make statements. We have a uh, legal counsel present from uh, Mr. Francis. Would legal counsel please introduce yourself? Good morning, Jane Hogan on behalf of Jerry Francis. I'll make a statement at the end with the committee. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Hogan. Also in attendance today in uh, opposition, we have Chad Chaffee, Nick Chaffee, Brenda Johnson, Wilford Johnson, Stacy Chafford, Jean Chafford, Chaffee, and representing the Louisiana Attorney General's Office, Mr. Attorney Joseph Lebeau. Joseph Lebeau, yes, sir. Okay. Also representing the 16th JDC uh, District Attorney's Office, Ms. W. Claire Howard. And she would like to make a statement. Sir. And Ms. LeBeau, you would like to make a statement also? Yes, sir. Okay. At the appropriate time, we'll give you a chance to do that. In support of uh, Ms. Francis, we have his attorney, Ms. Jane Hogan, uh, Ms. Karen Myers, Louisiana Parole Project, Dr. Kevin Mark, a cousin, and Mr. Norris Henderson, uh, representing the first seven two and vote. And uh, we will give Mr. Myers, Dr. Mark and Mr. Tennyson a chance to make a statement at the appropriate time. 
Do you understand the process, of Mr. Francis? Yes, sir, I do, sir. I'm going to read some information and then we'll conduct the interview. Uh, Mr. Francis is a first felony offender. Uh, his offense is armed robbery in Acadia Parish. He was sentenced on October 24th, 2016. And he, at that time, he was resentenced. His original sentence was back in 1976, nine, nine years, but Acadia Parish resentenced him in 2016 for a term of 50 years. He was sentenced on November 10th, 1976 in St. Martin Parish for armed robbery, and he received a nine-year nine sentence. The first year sentence that he received at resentencing ran uh, concurrently to the nine nine year sentence in St. Martin. His total sentence is nine nine years. Is that correct? Yes, sir. His parole date was October 12, 2003. His adjusted good time date is December 6, 2029, and his full term date is June 14, 2075. Is all this information correct, Mr. Francis? Yes, sir, it is, sir. Your case has been assigned to Mr. Freeman. Would you please answer Mr. Freeman's questions? Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Francis, uh, how old are you? I'm 64 years old, sir. Okay. And uh, how long have you served on this charge? I've served 46 years, 11 months, and nine days, sir. Okay. Um, what's your educational level? GED, sir. Okay. Was this your first felony conviction? Yes, sir, it was. Did you get your GED while you was in prison? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Francis, just try to walk me through those robberies. Tell me what was going on in your mind, what was going on in your life at that time? Well, sir, I was... At the time, I was going through a uh, transformation with identity crisis, didn't really understand who I was, but I make no excuse for that. I take full responsibility for everything that I did. I don't, I don't blame nobody or nothing for my circumstances. I take that responsibility for all the misconducts that I did, all the tragedies that I caused, all the pain that I caused, uh, my victims and my victims' family, I take full responsibility for that, sir. Okay, well, well, tell me exactly what did you do? Well, sir, in in the St. Mary Paris, St. Martin Paris Bank, I was responsible for shooting the shot. I shot the shot, sir. I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have did that. And I know that that was wrong. Uh, Accept full responsibility for that, sir. I have no problems about that. Uh, in the in the Crowley robbery, though I wasn't a shooter in that, I take responsibility because I was there and shouldn't have been there. I take full responsibility for all the hurt and the pain, all the tragedy that people are still going through from the trauma that I caused. That is my responsibility. I did that. Okay, um, your co-defendant was 26 years old. You were 17. How did y'all know each other? Well, I, I was, I stayed in uh, a housing project in, in the 
which was called, uh, I don't recall the name of it. I was standing, and he had got out of prison, and some kind of way we got to know each other, not really know each other, but it hadn't been like for maybe about two or three weeks. And that's how we got to got together during that time. That's when. Okay. Why commit the robbery? Were you on drugs? Were you on alcohol? No, sir. I, I'm not going to blame nothing for committing that robbery. I, I committed that robbery. Uh, I would say it had to be, I had to be out of greed, misunderstanding, being confused, uh, wanting to be accepted. And I allowed that to mislead me to do what I did. And I shouldn't have did that. Yeah, you come out with $30 from one of the robberies. Uh, I'm not sure how much you came out with from the bank, but taking people's lives for that little bit of money. Uh, I was just wondering what was going on in your life at that time. Uh, you look at the uh, community officials, and I'm going to read it because it's a bunch. Uh, the judge is uh, opposed. David Smith, uh, the assistant district attorney, Elliot Cassidy is opposed. Uh, the sheriff, KP Gibson of Acadian Parish is opposed. Uh, Chief Staley Rain is opposed. Uh, there was no comment from the judge in the 16th ADC. Uh, opposed is Mr. Dewey, DA in St. Martin, uh, opposed is uh, Sheriff Beckett Bro, St. Martin Parish, and Chief of Police, Ronald Salori. Your family is unopposed, Mr. Uh, Norris Henderson, uh, and, and he wrote some stuff. We've gotten tons of letters. Uh, quite obviously, there is a lot of opposition to you getting out. I mean, this was, you know, major crimes, uh, which affected a lot of people. How do you think you affected the families of so, these individuals that you shot? That well, the one that shot the one you were there, which is the same thing. Well, sir, I think that the impact that I've had on this family, I know that there's nothing that I could ever do to change that. But I would like them to know that I am very, very remorseful for all the pain and all the drama that I've caused them in, in this time. And I know it continued, and I know that it hurt, you know, as well as the society that I came out, and especially the family. I know that they're going through a lot. I know, and I am the cause of that, I am responsible for that. Uh, that is why I continue to strive to be the person that I am today, because I know that I can't make up for what I did. I know that I can't change what I did, but I can actually change who I am. And I have demonstrated that for the last 40 plus years, that I am not that person. I am not that immature juvenile that committed the crime that I committed. I'm not that person, sir. So. Okay, let me ask you this. Uh, you've taken uh, quite a few classes. What classes have you learned the most from? Give me a couple of them that have affected you the most. Well, for, first and foremost, I think that the hospice program is something that affected me so tremendously and changed my life forever because it taught me uh, the true essence of compassion. It taught me how to be responsible for caring for others. It, it just taught me. It taught me about life itself in general. It taught me that uh, to have love and to to be able to express that love, be able to interact with people and and care for people, and care, at the same time. You, you got, I got more out of it than I gave to it. 
you know, it was really tremendous and a blessing to be a part of that particular program within itself. And uh, another was de dealing with the Park Lookout Committee, with being able to bury people in dignity. Uh, that helped me tremendously too to grow to know that uh, all of those things take place in society and that though my society was inside here, that I was still a part of the society and I wanted to be able to be a contributor to that society as much as I could possibly be. Okay. Um, you know, the, the hospital program is a great thing. I mean, it is a very, I would say probably one of the hardest things to do in prison is hospice, uh, dealing with the ill and the sick and helping them out every day. Uh, so we thank you for that. Uh, but what exact class did you learn the most out of? Not program like the hospice or point lookout. What class, like anger management, victim awareness, this, or this change? Thing. Which well, class affected you the most? The class that affected me the most as far as class and education was victim awareness because I got to really see exactly what I put victims through. I got to be able to understand that uh, sometimes people are never going to be able to forget, and I understand that, and, and I empathize with those people in that particular area because I know that I hurt them. And I know that it's not easy for them to, to, to forgive. Well, and especially when you consider how uh, tragic my crime was. I understand that. I, mean, I okay. understand to be able to relate to them and understand the position that they take and not be upset and not be angry. Just, you know, I have to accept it for what it is. Uh, you had 132 write-ups, which is bad, but you've been in there 47 years, and I think your last write-up was 2012? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what was that last write-up about? Well, I was, I was at the administration building in the, in, in, the, in the main prison, and I left to go to the hospital and didn't check out. I didn't check out uh, with the prop. I didn't go through the prop season and checking out, but I left with the same person that I came with. So it was like I wasn't there, but I take responsibility for that too. I didn't check out. I was going to take care of patients. My mind was on the patient, and I didn't go through the prop season with that. Um, what is going to be your transition plan? We were to grant your release today. Well, sir, I, I plan to go to the parole project on a, kind of like a long-term basis to uh, reiterate back into society and have that transition process uh, professionally. And as well as that, I have an extended plan to go to uh, New Orleans area for the first 72 for continuous uh, process. All right. Uh, Warden, do you have any comments? Um, how long has he been there? How has he uh, behaved? Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mr. Jerry has been with us for a little over eight months. And if I could use two words to describe him, one would be consistent, the other would be humble. Uh, Mr. Jerry gets up every day consistent, he goes to work with no complaints. And before this, hearing today i already got a call saying what are we going to do without mr Jerry?" um because his work environment and the people that he worked with uh, truly do appreciate the hard work that he does want the other thing i would say is humble um every day you see mr jerry he's got a smile on his face and encouraging always willing to help somebody um i just i don't know about his crime all i can say is the man that i see sitting next to me and he made a true impact on not only me, but everybody in this facility, so. 
And what what is his facility? He works at our staff development center. It's kind of like our hotel for when people come in from out of the area to train and do uh, in service. He is their office orderly and he cleans up and he helps with the uh, anything really they have. He kind of sometimes helps them in the kitchen, sometimes helps them clean the hotel. So he has kind of a mini hat kind of job. Uh, Mr. Chapman, that's all the questions. Okay. okay. Let me clear, clear the record. Mr. Francis, in mention the two armed robberies, let me clear the record. The first armed robbery was in Acadia Parish in a, in a town of Rain, Louisiana. Is that correct? Yes, sir. It's very crowded, but it was Rain, Louisiana, right? Yes, sir. Rain. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was and the second armed robbery was in St. Martin Parish at the uh, St. Martin Plus Bank, and it was in Hawks, Louisiana. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mrs. Jackson. Good morning, Ms. Francis. I just have a couple of questions. You know, as I, I read your file, you know, I was interested in how it was that a 17-year-old and a 26-year-old were involved in the commission of this crime. Uh, so, you know, you, you kind of, you know, I, I know that you, you know, accept responsibility and that was basically your response, but I'm interested in how does a 17-year-old and a 26-year-old become partners in crime? Well, ma'am, I, I, I really don't that, you know, being honest, I don't like to place my I'm responsibility. Not, I'm not asking you to do All that. Right. I'm asking you, how did you and Mr. Dimache become partners in crime? Well, because I, I looked up to him and, and and I was mad in the wrong direction with him, something that I had never did before. Uh, and that's why I always say, you know, when I say that I don't put no responsibility on nobody else, but that was actually what happened. And, but I still take responsibility for it because I- I'm should. not saying you're not accepting responsibility. I'm just- Usually you don't have a 17 year old and a 26 year old hanging out here. Okay. It's almost a 10 year age difference. Uh, so what was your family situation? Well, my family situation at the time, we, we were very uh, proud. I mean, did, did you have both parents? No, no ma'am, I was a, in a in a single household parent. How many kids uh, did you have? How many siblings? I had uh at that time I had uh ten siblings. Ten? Yes, were they were they in the same household? Yes, ma'am. And how was it how many bedrooms in the in the project department? We had four. And so, so you had 11 people living in your house. Where did you fall in age? Were you the oldest, the youngest, somewhere in the middle? I was the second to the oldest. Okay. Um, and how were you in school when you were 17? No, ma'am. I, I, I got out of school when I was in the third grade. And how, oh. I, got, how I got there, I, I used to be going around and do little hustling, you know, like cutting grass and stuff like that, you know, to make ends meet, you know, to try to help my mother out with things, you know, that, you know, basically. It was how, how do you stop going to school in the third grade? I just wasn't gone. You know, wasn't gone, man. Uh, and so you, how many brothers do you have? Uh, I have three young yeah. boys. Three. Did you have an older brother? No, ma'am. 
So you were the oldest of the, the brothers, if you will. And did you know Mr. Dimache before he went to prison? Did you know anything about him? Well, ma'am, I didn't know him. I didn't know him until he got out of prison. Well, what was it about him that made you look up to him? <laughs> Looking back on it, I you know, I just really wanted to be accepted. I mean, I you know, and, and he was like the guy on the block, you know, the new guy, you know, and I just kind of like claimed to him and, and I just accepted the leadership from him that wasn't conducive to life itself. Period. Because I actually not only did I ruin people's lives for my affiliation with him, I also ruined my life. Well, let's talk about um, the hospice uh, program. How long have you been? How long have you been involved with hospice? I actually been involved from the onset of hospice uh, for twenty four years. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a type of error in the in the paper, it says 34, but it's 24 years, no over 24 years. And what exactly was your role with hospice? Uh, my role was actually to take care of patients, uh, to uh, assist Did that involve? Them, Did that involve? Assist, them, assist them in bathing, uh, assist them spiritually, assist them in writing letters, uh, being there for them when they needed someone to talk to, being there for them and when they take their last breath, you know, uh, because in most times when people are, are going out, they they really just want something to hold on to, someone to be there for them, and, and it, it it be hard, but becomes easy because you know that what you're doing is genuine, it's sincere, and it's loving, and it's Compassion, and you get more out of it than than you put in. I benefited from that program tremendously, and that's why I went all out to give my services. To them. And uh, the Point Lookout Project. How long were you involved with that? Uh, we actually, uh, and this was created around the same, or maybe a little bit before, when we actually start burying, because at one point we used to just uh, dig a hole and put people in without having services. Uh, but we went to see that that wasn't actually humane, you know, just to just throw somebody in a hole just because they're in prison, you know, or whatever. So we start uh, campaigning to get something better for, People for the end for at the, at their last place to be placed where their families could come to funerals and see a dignitary person, a dignitary funeral, and that was the drive to do that. And do you have any surviving family members? Yes, ma'am. I have uh, all my siblings are still alive, and I have uh, my aunt Geraldine, uh, and I have. Uh, my cousin Kevin, which is here today, which is her son, you know, I have, I've been having real strong family support, you know, I, I don't have no problems about my family support, they've been supporting me. Well, thank you, that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Francis, we've talked about uh, the hospice program, and we've talked about Point Lookout. So let's talk about the Human Resources Club. What's your role and what's your involvement with the Human Resource Club? Well, the Human Resource Club was uh, actually an organization that reached out to uh, people that was in need uh, in and out. You know, it was, in, it was an inside organization as well as an outside organization. And uh, we try to help people with uh, spiritual, physical, social, economics, uh, and it goes on. Whatever help that we can show to someone uh, 
that was in need of crisis, whether it be someone to help counsel or someone to uh, that needed a meal to eat or whatever it is, that's what we did. Well, where did you get the financial resources to offer this help to people in need? Well, we had uh, several, several lucrative programs in place. Uh, we organized uh, concessions that we actually sold stuff that we were able to uh, uh, finance uh, some of the programs. We had we would have fundraisers that we would deal with to raise funds to take care of different things like that. I also see that you officiated sporting events at uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary. Tell us about the volleyball and the boxing association. Well, yes, sir. Uh, that was like an outreach program to try to uh, contact with the younger prisoners that was coming in prison, and that way uh, to get them started with things that would be more progressive as far as for their growth and development in prison instead of going the other way. And that was the purpose of us uh, dealing with the uh, Angola Amateur Boxers uh, Hospice Association, I mean, uh, the uh, Soccer Association, uh, football. We, we, we went around with the school system. Thank you, sir. Are there any more questions? At this time, we're going to hear from the supporters. Uh, Mr. Karen Myers from the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, good morning. Uh, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, Mr. Francis has been a client of ours for quite some time. Um, we recognize uh, the things that he's done during his 46 years of incarceration. Uh, I know him personally, and, and I've, uh, I've watched this man live his life inside the institution with integrity. Uh, I've seen him involved, uh, become a, a charter member of hospice uh, as someone who coordinated Point Lookout for more than 12 years. He was one of the most uh, loyal and dedicated volunteers uh, uh, every time we needed him uh, with Point Lookout. Uh, his other programs, obviously, he's done the hard work with victim awareness and thinking for a change in anger management and substance abuse. Uh, he's given to his faith community. Uh, he was 17 years old. Uh, at the time of his crimes. Obviously, a, a, a child with no direction, uh, no role models, looking for acceptance and approval from someone, which he found in someone uh, 10 years older than him. Uh, no excuses, as he said, but, but he was certainly at 17 susceptible uh, to those influences, and he committed, he committed some horrible crimes. But it's been 46 years, and he's done He's done hard work, he's done excellent work, and he's lived with integrity. Um, we are happy to provide long-term support for Mr. Francis uh, while he, he gets his life back together. Uh, again, from 17 to now 64 years old, the transition is going to be significant. Uh, but since his last hearing, he's continued to do the same things. He never let the denial of the last hearing uh, deter him or derail him. He's continued. He's, he went from Angola to the state police barracks. He's continued to do all the things that he needs to do to be the person that he is today. I mean, we just ask that you you grant his parole today. Parole Project is here to, to, to give him all the support needed in his transition. And I know you're gonna hear from Mr. Henderson about even additional support. So we would just ask that, that, that today is the day that Mr. Francis gets his second chance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Uh, let's hear from, uh, one second, Dr. Kevin uh, Marks, his cousin. Yes, good morning. And thank you for allowing me to be here to support Jerry's uh, parole request. Um, in 1976, I was eight years old and Jerry was my uh, eldermost cousin who at that point, I really didn't know all that well. But I remember uh, vividly that, you know, in studying what was going on among the other family members, the adults, that he had done something real bad. And um, I, it left me with this impression of him that, um, uh, that 
I held on to for many years. About 17 years ago, um, uh, Jerry and I reconnected, reacquainted uh, while he was at uh, Angola. And we have maintained a very uh, strong and developed a strong relationship over those 17 years. I've gotten to know him. And after the first year or so and talking to him very regularly, I realized that how this is not the guy who create, who developed or who did these crimes back in the seventies. What I have learned about Jerry over the years is that, I mean, he is such a resilient guy. He is filled with compassion. As a physician, I can tell you, one of the hardest things I have to do is have a discussion with the family about cancer or take care of a patient at the end of their lives. And Jerry did that and does that through the hospice program. And that speaks a lot to his character. Um, he is uh, very sensitive to the needs of others. He's always you know, asking, inquiring about other family members and their struggles. And he, uh, off, he is a very wise guy, very filled with wisdom. And I often ask myself, I'm like, wow, how could he have developed so much wisdom living in that confined, secluded uh, environment at Angola? But he uh, is very well read, he studies, and he is very mature. He's a very hard worker. He really enjoys uh, doing things to put smiles on people's faces, and he does not ever want to do anything to sadden anyone. Uh, as a representative of his family, we are a very um, blessed and large family, and we are a faith-based family, and Jerry clings on to his faith. Uh, we uh, will offer full support to him uh, if granted his release and uh, full, full support in every aspect. We want to see him be successful. Um, we... Um, uh, want to be able to get to know him uh, in the mainstream. We want to be able to uh, let our our kids get to know him. And he has a very, very good story to tell. And uh, in, part of, in our conversations, one of the things that he really wants to do is be involved in whatever community he's living in, to uh, be part of a community outreach program to help misguided youths as he was a misguided youth back in 1976. So I ask on behalf of his family that you give the highest level of consideration to releasing him and allowing him to come back to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Uh, Ms. Norris Henderson. Good morning. Uh, well, I've been knowing Jerry for 27 years, uh, 27 little years inside with him, and then 20 years inside with him. I visited Jerry, I was still named over, two weeks ago at the police I, I guess I'm the, the, the kind of proof of putting on cool Jerry. I've watched Jerry do. We actually created a hospital program together, the two of us, a few other guys. And one of the things we learned about hospital, one of the jobs, it wasn't something that everybody did. We asked asked the question about what was the role. We had two teams of people. I mean, some folks who did direct service, I mean, hands on with agents, giving them bad feet, whatever you took, and to folks who just done administrative. Talked about Point Lookout, uh, uh, Gary, was a part of our wise association also. And what that made me remember how we actually formed the uh, Gary. The Gary who came out, we had nine guests that week. And during the process, they were all used to deliver calls. And there was one call for short. We had one guy who was actually in the box. And he literally fell out of the box. And at that point, Lord Payne suggests that we need to do something more dignified for these persons. And so through hospice and the uh, barrier too, we started washing the bodies, dressing them because we put in all the things, putting the body bags, and up from 
And so you have to have a certain chemistry to do that. And for uh, Jerry to be still part of, but not such the last six months, but but that goal of uh, still being a part of this that's just point for the inception. Uh, part of the current work I want to do, making awareness that our early stage of incarceration, none of this stuff existed prior to 1990. We couldn't even go to school, let alone do anything else. So when I looked at the thing, I was checking off all the questions that was like, GBD, I was something to something. But everything else that Jerry has done is for somebody else. Possibly somebody else. The burial group, somebody else. Making awareness of finding self, but more about how other people think and feel about his particular behavior. The human resources. Human resources, far from being the part in the role for the gym, we used to pay for the ads. And during this spell, when nobody was getting part of recommendations, important, we bought into human resources, human relations, for less to kind of help the guys in the prison to sustain. And by this time, a lot of folks didn't have loved ones still alive or still around. And so we provided care packages for our girls and the Sports. I coached football for 10 years. One of his coaches and he introduced. And but all of that was more like us, but, but it's still something to those younger guys who came out, to those young guys who, like Jerry himself was. And one of the questions then the Jackson kept asking, why would you follow somebody who's 10 years old? And you know, the hard reality is that our ghetto heroes are not the role models like we do. And so sometimes we get caught up following people who we think is the role model that we see as opposed to the role model like his cousin Kevin, who we didn't see when we were young. And so in this day and age, I think the opportunity now that Jerry's growing up, he's 47 years old, he's actually a certain half of the nine and he is so. And I would just ask him for it really to really just consider that. I mean, we've seen Jerry like this is his fifth time, and we've seen. You know, he's going through this just thing, but every time we've seen him, he's advanced himself. And if we look at the total prison population of this state, Jerry's in the facility now with only 92 people. So that means he's one of the most trusted people within correction in the state. And I think that has value added in the Can never, can never undo the harm. Can never do it. I know what that feels like. I lost a son, I just lost a brother last July to violence. And I know what that feels like. One of the founding members of our organization is in a heart attack two days ago. So I know what pain and hurt, all that looks like. Sometimes you never get over. You know, my son's been dead 24 years. Sometimes I wake up and can't get out of bed. That suck, trigger something to make me think of something. I literally paralyzed. I can understand what this man is going through and has been through. I would just ask that this is about mercy more than anything else. Give these people who have a choice not to give anybody they want more. But we just ask for mercy that this Lord hear our view, that this family find it in their home to show Jerry mercy, you know, forgiveness, you know, you're not entitled to forgiveness. Mercy. We act too much because we're always seeking the source. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Um, I'm going to let the family decide who will speak first. Eugene? Okay. Just introduce yourself and state your. Uh, what involvement you have with me. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Roche. My name is Gene Shaw. My mother was Beverly Shaw. Jerry's victim in the first bank robbery. Uh, Jerry and Preston, when they robbed the bank, um, they were sentenced to 99 years without probation and parole. And at the time, our families were, were told they never going to get out case closed, done deal. Um, in past hearings, uh, I 
this is the first time I hear Jerry ever express any type of remorse. In the past hearings, he's you know, put the blame on Preston, you know, Preston was his influence, and it's not a 10-year difference. That's an exaggeration. It's a seven-year difference. So the exaggerations keep coming on in Jerry's story from what you hear. Um, he has petitioned that his sentence be reduced to five years. He has petitioned that I not be allowed to speak at hearings because I was a juvenile and my mother was shocked. I mean, does that sound like a guy that is remorseful, you know? No, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, you mentioned he had over 130 disciplinary write-ups. He's been a trustee. He's had that revolt. He sued the prison to get that back. You know, so it's only recently that Jerry has seemed to be a good actor in prison. Um, my family, the entire community of Parks, the sheriff, the mayor, my senator, my legislator, the chief of police, you've got all these letters, the people that know the details of this crime, then Jerry should stay right where he is, serve his sentence. Um, when they robbed the bank, uh, Jerry and Preston had gone to the bank in the morning. Uh, there was a crowd there, so they rode around the parks until the crowd left. And they went in the bank. Uh, my mother worked there alone. She had been at the bank about eight years. And on that morning, she turned the cameras on before they walked to the door. Back then, you had to turn the cameras on and wasn't automatic. But she had seen them during the day, early that morning, and she knew exactly what they had come to do. So they went in the bank. Uh, Jerry's the one who, here's a picture of Jerry leaving the bank with the gun in his hand. Okay, Jerry was the actual shooter. I have a picture of Jerry standing over my mother's body in the tower. Jerry's a guy. Okay. Jerry is also the shooter in rain. He denied that, but Jerry's also the shooter in rain. Um, when you read the statements from Jerry and Preston when they were arrested, there's only one thing that these two guys agreed upon, and those were my mother's last words. My mother's last words were, please don't shoot me. It's only money. She begged for a time. And he shot her anyway. He shot my mother here with a left temple blow. She was completely paralyzed, stayed in a coma for 14 months, never moved, never spoke. They told us she was deaf, she was blind, but her prefrontal lobe was still intact and she had brain activity. So my mother could still think. And can you, can you imagine? Completely paralyzed, can't communicate, you can't do anything. Can still think that was a condition that my mother was in. You know, we, we harp on, you know, Jerry was being 17. Oh, okay. Had Jerry stayed in school, he would have graduated in high school two weeks before. Had he not gone to prison, he would have been able to vote that year. He'd have been in the service country. He'd have been able to, you know, buy alcohol. This was not a kid. This is not some 13 year old kid that, you know, was influenced by someone who's a little bit older. Jerry. He was a man at the time. You felt him there. So, for two weeks prior, when they killed Mr. Johnson, he went to rent a car, took that car, went to rob a bank. Bank was occupied, so they went to the hardware store and shot Mr. Johnson. They shot him the same way, execution style. Mr. Johnson was on the floor and he shot him in the back. On July 1st, 1976, while he was in police custody, Jerry also confessed to the March 30th, 1976 robbery of the Hasty Martin in Iberia and the murder of 62 year old Louis Gladden. September 17th, Malcolm Roy also testified on the that Jerry President robbed the Hasty Martin killed Mr. Gladden. Malcolm Roy confessed to a driven getaway for him. Jerry personally led the investigators to the murder weapon of the Hasty Martin. And ballistics proved it was the same weapon used in the bank robbery and in rain. Mr. Okay. Shaw, you're over your time limit. I understand. I thought I had 10 minutes, sir. No, no, no. The family has 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. But well, what I'm saying is we we read we read your letter. I read it twice. And I understand exactly what you're saying. Would you wrap it up? I will wrap it up. 
Uh, we're here because of, of, of Morgan and Montgomery. Okay. Uh, Morgan and Montgomery clearly states it's for first offense and for non homicidal stuff. Jerry has always already been given a break on the first sentence. Reduced to 50 years, made concurrent, that essentially wiped that sentence off and told these people that, you know, your grandfather's death is nothing. And when my mother died, and we talked about mercy, when my mother died, we were approached, did we want to go ahead and pursue murder conviction for Jerry because she hadn't died at the time of trial? And at that time, the death penalty was back in effect. So it was an option for us. But we said no. We said no. Let him live. He's in there for 198 years. We were merciful with Jerry then. And the court has been merciful with him on his first. He's had his mercy already. That's our position. Thank you, Richard. Okay. And thanks, Percy. Please give us your name and your relationship to the case. My name is Wilfred Johnson, and uh, my grandfather was Curtis Johnson, which was murdered by Jerry. Yes. And uh, I'm here to represent my grandfather, Curtis Johnson, who was robbed at gunpoint and murdered by Jerry Francis. On May 10th, today's May 9th, tomorrow is the anniversary of his death by being shot. At Jerry's trial, Jerry Francis and Preston Dumachet admitted prior to going into Hank's hardware store uh, in rain, they planned to leave no witnesses. So they had in mind they would nobody, whoever was there, they was gonna kill. Jerry Francis then went in uh, the store. Robbed my grandfather. He made my grandfather get on all fours, on his hands and knees. And then uh, after they robbed him, they were leaving the store. And Preston Dumashek said to uh, uh, Jerry, he said, you forgot something. Jerry went back in the store and shot my grandfather in the back of the head and killed him. He died right away. And... Uh, so Jerry, uh, they, ki they killed my grandfather for $30. My grandfather never resisted or put up a fight. My grandfather was well known and liked in town. He was a very hard worker. All his life, he worked hard and, and, and mind his own business and took care of his family. And uh, he didn't take anything from anybody. And then uh, after they, they robbed Jerry, two weeks later, Jerry Francis and Preston Dumashek went to the St. Martin Bank in Parks and robbed and shot Mrs. Beverly Chopin. So uh, she was a bank teller. And then they caught and they were caught and convicted of armed robbery and murder. And they were each sent, this is what I don't understand, they were each sentenced to two counts of 99 years, no probation, no parole. And then now, every so many years, we got to come back and and and, and fight for our, the, 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 our, our parent, grandparents and parents. Uh, so we, we're here again to relive the death of my grandfather. And uh, because of the laws have changed, the murders are now being given another chance for release. But what about what about my grandfather's rights and stuff? He didn't get a chance to come back. They took that away from him. They took his wife and, and Miss Bell. They, took, they, didn't, they didn't give her another chance on him. Uh, and so they, he's talking about a second chance, but my grandfather and, and Miss Bell would never had him. Uh, it'll be 47, the 47 year anniversary of my grandfather's. So that means that Jerry Francis was served only 47 years for two armed robberies and two murders. So that's like half, half the sentence that uh, he was sentenced for. Please consider that Jerry Francis was a cold-hearted murderer at 17 years old. His own mother knew how bad he was. And he was the one who turned him in after seeing his picture on the TV, on a bank robbery. 
despite the changes in laws, does it make it right to let a two, two count of armed robber and murder out of prison Her, His victim had no right to life. Please don't let anyone else be a victim of their crisis. No one should have to go through, but we still have to. How could Jared Francis possibly be a benefit to society, especially today? My grandfather's legacy lives on through me and my children and grandchildren. If this man goes free, uh, I and my family will lose faith in the legal system. We trusted the legal system this far. We hope our system doesn't fail us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And we have one. One more speech. Today, you in your relationship to the case. Good morning, my name is Nicholas Shaw. Uh, I would have been Beverly Shaw's uh, grandson, but honestly, I think that that chance that I'm here. Um, it's the fifth time that my uncle's had to read it. It's, it's very hard to watch. I almost feel that I was his age. To hear him go through this five, six times over and over, just here less than a month ago, and I had to sit here and hear him relive that when he was a kid over and over and over. We're just asking that hopefully keep him where he's supposed to be because the last time Mr. Francis was out, he murdered two people behind the head. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Shaw. Okay. Um, who would like to close it out for the victim? Okay, uh, Mr. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Just give your full name and the organization you represent. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Joseph Lodo, yes. the Attorney General's Office, Louisiana Department of Justice. In 1976, Jerry Francis callously murdered Beverly Shaw and Curtis Johnson. I think it's important that those names be spoken. And I find it ironic that Mr. Francis, who was given a half an hour to speak, never actually said their names, even though he claims to accept responsibility for his actions. He also never went over the specific acts that he committed after being asked by multiple members of his board. He failed to mention that he cased the bank that they specifically targeted that were by themselves in a hardware store and at a bank, and that they specifically made Ms. Shaw and Mr. Johnson lie on the ground before he executed for no other reason than to murder the only innocent witness to his case. The Louisiana Department of Justice vehemently opposes the release of Mr. Francis for multiple reasons. This board should consider the horrific nature of the crime. I think that's been spoken about plenty today. I ask that you take that into consideration. More importantly, though, the fact that he has never actually truly shown remorse for his comments. He didn't mention the names. He didn't talk about the facts. He has previously attempted to prevent the families from speaking at these, at these hearings. That does not sound like somebody who truly feels sorry and accepts responsibility for his actions. He filed a motion to reduce the St. Martin Parish sentence to to zero to five years. Quite frankly, that's insulting to the family and again shows a complete lack of any true remorse. Finally, members of the board, I ask you to recognize the fact that Mr. Francis has already been granted in multiple forms of grievances. But for the fact that the first degree murder statute was found constitutional right at the time that he committed these crimes, he would likely be either on death row or serving a life without. After that, in 2016, he was resentenced to 50 years on one of the armed robbery counts, another form. And finally, he has been given the opportunity to earn good time. I believe he has a good time date of 2029. That is the third form of relief that he has been offered. I ask that you require him to serve out that good time. He continues to not get in trouble in prison. That's for the good time. I believe Judge Jackson specifically asked him about an incident in 2012. Mr. Francis stated that was because he didn't check in, check out. Well, according to the DPS records on September 12, 2012, he was actually convicted of threatening behavior. 
This is yet another example of failure to take responsibility for his actions. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, again, we ask that you recognize the relief already received by Mr. Francis, weighed out against the immeasurable loss of the parks and rain communities, as well as the victims and their families. We ask that you deny that application. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lubo. Okay. The DA from the 16th yes. ADC. Yes, sir. My name is Claire Howington, and I'm from the 16th DA's office. Um, I have actually been appointed with this case for it's 2016 when I started working at the DA's office. And uh, one of the things that always strikes me about Mr. Francis's case is when people in the community, the parks, learn that this case is still ongoing, the thing that they always, always tell me is that was the day that parks started mocking that this was the crime that changed the character of that community so deeply that they all became. And I think that that's something that this board really needs to consider. When I, I know you've heard so much about the facts of this case, but I want to talk about how this really affected everyone in the community, as well as the family members. Uh, the last time I was here, Mr. Cho brought this up briefly. This is the fifth time that Mr. Francis has been here for parole. And I remember at the last time that specifically he showed no remorse. He made no contrition. And this is the first time that I have ever heard him say anything that sounds like contrition to me. Um, you know, and one of the things that really strikes me about that is that you have heard so much about the compassion that he has showed to his fellow inmates, but there's been no compassion of his crimes. There's been no compassion for what that effect has had on the community. And I'm, you don't know what's in someone's heart, but I do find that that is, um, it's been 46 years. And he's just getting around to that now. Uh, again, this is something where two people were killed in a very, very deliberate and horrible way. He has only served 46 years, 46 years for two lives. He does have a good time date. Again, as my colleague said, he has really seen multiple forms of relief, and we would really strongly ask that you make him serve out the rest of that time. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Mr. Francis? Yes, sir. Would you like to make a brief closing statement? Yes, sir. Well, they said that I didn't mention the name of Ms. Governor Shaw or Mr. Johnson. And I understand it hurt. I, I mean, I, I truly do. I, I, I get it. Mr. 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 Francis? Don't address the statements. Address why you think we should parole you. Well, sir, I think that my record is going to speak for itself. I think that after y'all carefully observed the record, and I hope that y'all see that I deserve the opportunity. You know, not not me saying I deserve. Just look at my records and see whether I deserve that opportunity or not. That's that's all I'm asking for, uh, for from y'all. And I'll understand one way or the other. Um, Thank you, Mr. Francis. Mrs. Holden. Thank you, Mr. Roche. There is no question that what Mr. Francis did 46 years ago was heinous and atrocious. It's not really a question about that. Um, but the inquiry doesn't stop there. Mr. Francis was 17 years old. And so what the Supreme Court says is that condemning Mr. Francis to a lifetime of incarceration is unconstitutional only if his crime was the mark of someone who's permanent, eligible, and capable of being able to Evaluating Mr. Francis's record, not just what happened for what he did, what he caused 46 years ago, evaluating the entirety of his record, there is clear demonstrated maturity and rehabilitation. 
over the last 46 years. Um, you've heard exhaustively about Mr. Francis being a founding member of the Hospice Organization. Look out, he took every available class good during his GED in 1997 before he had any hope of release while he was serving 198 year sentence. He made the effort to prove himself to help people. There was a write up in 2012, which was discussed at his last hearing, which was at Angola. And I think the wording there explained the 2012 write up was. And I think the prior panel recognized that it was a low level offense. Um, but his write up before that was in 2004. Last write up before 2012 was in 2004. So in 19 years, Mr. Prince had one disciplinary write up. He's been a class A trustee for 20 years, and there is objective evidence that Mr. Francis poses no threat to society. There's the tiger risk assessment, which designates him as low. And also, if the board looks at prior jobs, he worked on the B line around children and women at Angola. He worked in the hospital around nurses at Angola. He worked on death row as a death row orderly around. Um, around other people, Mr. Francis, is, and now he's in the state police barracks where he interacts daily with members of law enforcement, the public, and everybody has always received glowing recommendations and letters of support. This is the true testament to his character. This is rehabilitation that is measurable objectively. It's not Mr. Francis attempting to uh, put on a show. This is, he turned a corner and he never looked back. If he is granted Release, he's not returning to the community that he devastated. He is going to Baton Rouge. He will then transition to New Orleans. There is support for him in the area. And I would also, there was mention about Mr. Francis's good time date, which is six years, he would be 72 years old. What the Supreme Court says is that the opportunity for it be meaningful and it must be based on re rehabilitation and maturity. So the good time date is an operation of law, it's not based on what he did or did not do within, within prison, what he, the meaningful opportunity for release is today is at least the old friends. I would further um, note that Preston Dimanche remains in prison, the same considerations of the mitigating factors of youth and board directed group three or four would not apply in any, in any parole hearing that Preston Dimanche ever has before this board. Um, and so given all of that, and given as Gary Myers pointed out, his repeated denials of parole, he's never lost hope. He's never lost, he's never discouraged. He's continued to find other ways to better himself. He's now at the barracks. He's taken a dip since the last hearing two years ago. He got recertified as NCPR, he took additional programs uh, for skilled nursing and in the quiet nursing. He's taken self help programs while at the state of these barracks. And Mr. Francis will continue to do this because this is who. Um, this is who he is. He, and so based on his rehabilitation, maturity, Based on who he is today, we would ask the story to grant Mr. Prince release the many conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. Is the panel ready to vote? Mr. Rocha, I'd like to move for executive session. I second. Is there a problem? This is definitely an interesting case. You know. Thought we get a hot mic. I do have like transcripts, but there's really like nothing in it. Um, it's 
just mentions the armed robbery and in the research that like Richard had sent me and then I looked it over, it, it all it shows is an armed robbery. There was no mention of, and I'll put the link in the description of any killing. So I was just confused as the hearing started and was going on and really it didn't seem that they touched on anything that had happened until the victim started to speak. And then you get the whole picture. I don't know how this court case was done legally, but I mean, there's even things in this legal statement that says that a life imprisonment without parole for non-homicide offense committed by a juvenile offender is not constitutional, but he murdered two people. You know, the, the, once the victim spoke, I really got sold on it. He's getting out in six years anyways. It's like, this should be an easy, an easy decision. He's already gotten so much and he's getting, and, and I don't believe that he has remorse either. You can't, you're going to file a petition to not have the victim speak at your hearings. And the way that he shot back in response to uh, when it was his turn to speak, it, it, it was like he was on the attack. It wasn't. And, they, and Mr. Roche had to stop him and tell him to just talk to them and to address his situation. It was kind of scary. And, you know, I was going to give him credit to say, hey, he took accountability. He didn't blame it on, on him being younger and the other person being older. But then you find out from the victims that he had blamed it on the older man over and over and over again, and he must have heard that he should stop doing that, so he didn't do that. I the, I'll tell you, the, the, the picture that the from the Attorney's General Office, which gives them a lot of kudos for showing up, we see so often that they don't, and, and the, the, the other victims, relatives, they painted a picture that is entirely different than the one that was being painted pretty much this entire hearing. I thought it was a given. I thought he was being kind of coddled. And then we see, we see the other side of the picture. And I don't think this is one of the situations where you have three sides, his side, their side, and the truth. I mean, from what it seems that from what we're hearing that this this man spent a long time in denial blaming others and to petition that the victim shouldn't show up that just shows total disregard for the victim's feelings and then even to have a hearing now to get out a handful of years early remember this is to get his sentence com well, actually this is a parole hearing because he already got it commuted. So, well, he wants to get out. What's he have to lose in his mind? But again, that doesn't show. He took two lives. He took two lives. And, and one of his mothers begging for her for her life. It's just money, she says. And you shoot her in the back of the head. How does someone like that get deserve to get out any earlier? And like they said, he's 17 years old. He was going to graduate high school in two. He was able to buy liquor back then, 18. He was able to join the army. He was a, he was a man. The part I'm a little confused about is when he said there was a six year difference, not a ten year difference. I, I'm pretty sure it was a ten year difference. I thought he was 27 years old, and he was 17 years old. But maybe um, maybe they're wrong on his age it wasn't 27 and then miss jackson was, was trying to lead into it maybe either to see if you would take accountability if you would blame it on the age difference but she's like why would a 27 year old uh be hanging out with a 17 year old but i would also argue that it's it, it is a big age grab 27 year olds shouldn't hang out with 17 year olds and certainly you can be influenced by a 27 year old but it's not like it's not huge. 27-year-olds, 
Eh, it's not common. It's I wouldn't say it's common, but it's not a huge discrepancy. It certainly is immature of the 27 year old, but but 17 year olds usually look up to older dudes and they want to hang out with them. And there definitely could have been manipulation there, but it's not like he was 14. There's just, this is a big difference. For me, this one's easy. He, let, let him serve out his sentence. It's just a handful of years more. I mean, why would you disrespect the victims? Just so he, so he, the murderer of two, could get out early. I'm having like trouble with my connection. I hope that. Let's hope that we don't have an issue. Oh, here we are. That means is the panel ready to vote? Yes, sir. Mr. Freeman? I, I just want to say this before I give my decision and the reasons for my decision. First off, I will say this is the hardest case I've ever been to so We have two victims, both ended up deceased. We have a man that's done what he's supposed to do in prison. But there's also the punitive end to things. And like I said, there's two deceased victims. Uh, and, and you ought to be able to compare this a lot, Mr. Francis, because you did work in hospice. I mean, this young man right here, Mr. Shope, had to sit there like he worked in hospice with his mother for 16 months until she passed away. Uh, I cannot even fathom, would not you know, fathom. Um, and you do have a good time day. So my vote today is going to be to deny and uh, with the message. Please, 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 no reactions. This is the court. We are not judging. Vote to deny. Okay. Mrs. Jackson. Hi. Uh, Mr. Francis, um, you have done some good work. Uh, you have been incarcerated for 47 years. Um, but you know, when I look at the circumstances of the offense and the fact that two people were killed, I also look at the fact that you do have a date. You are going to be released from prison uh, in 2029, regardless of what this uh, board does today. And because of the strong opposition from uh, the victims' families, uh, the district attorney, the attorney general's office, all law enforcement entities uh, in the affected parishes and the impact of crime on those communities, uh, my vote likewise would be to do Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Mr. Francis, today I am the longest sitting board member on this panel. If I'm not correct, this is the third time that I'm sitting on a panel and you have made a request. Lady early release. I have, today I have seen the vast difference between hearing number three and number four. And I think I said on hearing number three and hearing number four. And I, I denied you both times because I didn't see 
the rehabilitation and the maturity that I was looking for. You were 17 years old at the time you committed this crime. By all standards, the Supreme Court of the United States considers you a juvenile life. In that court, in the Supreme Court of Louisiana, has mandated as one of my responsibilities when it, came, when it comes to juvenile lifers, I must look for a level of rehabilitation, which I see today, and a level of maturity, which I surely see today. And one of the, and I don't remember which, a federal law court said that I cannot use opposition as the sole reason for denying a juvenile life based on a level of maturity and rehabilitation that I see today. My vote is to grant your request for an early release. We have received two votes to deny your request, one vote to grant your request. Based on that vote, your request for early release has been denied. You have a good day. You know, this, this camera here at the top, it's, uh, I think it's the first time we've had that kind of camera view during the voting process. I wonder if they'll continue to do that. It's interesting. Um, also interesting that Mr. Roche, the victim's advocate, voted in his favor. And I like to think he only did that because he knew he was going to get denied. He was the last to vote. And he just wanted to throw him a bone, so to speak. Again, as, as I had mentioned, I haven't seen, there's really not much to go through over in this case because in this specific appeal, uh, just because it doesn't say anything in background, it was that there was with an armed robbery at a bank. Um, it, he was, the petitioner was 17 years old and found guilty. He was sentenced to 99 years of hard labor without parole. It's just so interesting that it doesn't mention the murders anywhere. But uh, interesting also, Mr. Freeman said this is the hardest case that he ever had to handle. And we have seen, he's been on the board quite some time. He has seen cases, so. Interesting that he felt that way. Uh, and I, I think hands down the right decision was made. He's getting out. He's getting out in like six years. I just can't believe that he petitioned that the victim's family can't be at his hearings. That's so callous. So callous. The, you know, just listening to the victims and the pain they went through. And I really do like what Mr. Freeman said. Uh, I actually liked what he said entirely. It was one of the more moving statements. He's, he's, he's usually just not a man of many words. But the idea of being in hospice, his mother, his grandmother, having, uh, having laid there with her frontal cord, you know, her, being totally cognitive and not being able to move the deaf and blind. That's just torture for over a year. It's a good, you know, I 
I don't have much to add. Uh, it, sh it shows what these crimes did to the community. Uh, I'm glad the attorney general's office showed up to, to speak in defense and they didn't leave the victims alone, which we've seen so many times. And that the board made the right decision. Uh, I think the very idea that he's that he was coming up for what it was his fourth parole hearing. And uh, he's getting out in six years in, in itself says something. Yeah, he's been locked up a long, long, long time and he's getting older. But, you know, to, to have to hear that victims even speak about that, you would think that. And to petition for them not to be allowed. It, to me, that just speaks volumes. And to have, what was it, his supporter, the doctor guy who's like sitting there shaking his head and all like upset at the decision. It's like, do you realize that there are other people watching this, like victims watching this, people who lost their loved ones that are watching this and you're shaking your head like a, like a little, like a, like a, like a juvenile, a 13 year old kid throwing a tantrum. Anyways. For me, it would have been a hard case if he was locked up for life, blah, blah, blah. But even then, after what the family said, it seems that a lot of his remorse was just faked. But I don't know. I'm, for me, I'm, I'm quite happy with the results. He's getting out anyways. And there's no reason to add insult to injury to the, to the victims. But with that, I'll let you go.